What's up? Hey, what's going on? Not much. How are you? Good. This is the first time I've seen Chris since, since Nain. How's it going, man? Your, beard, your beard's still looking strong. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm doing pretty good. I, uh, you know, stayed busy and stuff. I've been working a lot, so. How does it feel to be back in society? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> So how have you guys been? You guys been working or working from home probably? Uh, I've literally worked from this room for the last three months. Oh, geez, that's awful. Uh, I, I bought a new place in February. Yeah. And I've been delaying buying furniture and then COVID hit. So literally <laughs> I've had a bed and a desk in, in my house. So there's like there's nothing here. I love it. I have, I have my maps on the ground. That's pretty much all I need. Right? Yeah, that's plenty of map laying space right there. Oh, that's yeah. all it's important. <laughs> I love it. That's hilarious. Hey, what's yeah. up? You're back. Yeah. What was going on? No, a nice beard. Man, I have been growing this since March. Wow. It's. I think it's the longest it's ever been. Actually, it's not. It's not at Chris's level yet. No, I was getting there. I was getting pretty close there, but I had. To, I just had to go. The time. It was time. Yeah, you're. You're looking a little too, kept up there, Dave. Well, you know, it's the times. Is it like the, the dating season time or what? It's that too. Yeah, <laughs> it's, good, it's good fresh springtime look. Dave, also let's get let's get a sneak peek at that smile. Oh yeah, look at this. Check it out. I got all my teeth. Oh man, look at that. Oh, shit. Almost all of them. Still missing one. Well, that's not related to anything. No one could have even seen that though. You're good. All my teeth. Yeah, this bad boy right here. Dave, hey, what was the outcome with your back tooth there? Uh, it was just a collapsed filling and they just uh, put another, they capped it. They put a big cap on the whole thing. <laughs> Shape it down. Yeah, so it's essentially fake now too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Came, nice. out pretty lucky. Came out pretty lucky on that one. So, for everyone watching right now, we are with our Boil to Barren Lands expedition team. And in our last episode, episode thirteen, we did a little comment asking if you have any questions. We would do a Q and A for you guys. And because we are in two different provinces and one state, uh, we thought it'd be the I think the only way to do this was through a Zoom call. So we're, we're recording it, it's gonna be edited, and then it's gonna be online for you guys to see. So we, uh, what we did is we went through about 20 of the comments, and we're gonna go through them, everything from the planning, to the gear we used, to the food that we ate, to the team dynamics, all right? Just to be clear, you went through all the comments and you pulled out 20 of the most pressing questions. Yeah, there was a, uh, there was a bunch of comments. Um, it was it was pretty amazing to, to see all the comments from you guys. It was uh, it, it was pretty cool, and I appreciate all you guys' support through all this. It was uh, it was it was a big it was a big trip for all of us, and uh, yeah, glad to see you guys all follow along. I love hearing from all the Labradorians out there. Uh, the comments are being out on the land as well. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I'm coming back. Don't worry, I'll be back. <laughs> Let it so, be known. We'll kind of just go in like uh, in order here, starting with the planning of the trip. Oh man, that was a big project that went on for a long time. We started planning that in like November, like like eight or ten months before we even left. So it, even before that, you sp so the, the question is, how did the trips come to be, and how do we all know each other? And I think it started in the summer of two or in the spring of two thousand eighteen. Dave, you were heading on a on a fifty plus day canoe trip in the Northwest Territories, right. and, we, and we just met. And yeah. you were telling me about these trips that you've done and these larger expeditions, and that kind of sparked my interest in in my own curiosity on on doing something extended. Uh, I before this trip, I the longest I did was a two week trip, and hearing about your trip made me think it was possible that I could put my life aside and and go on a, on a, a grand adventure so over, over that summer i was thinking about it as, as you guys were traveling up, up in the northwest territories 
And I, I pitched it to Alex very casually. And he, I don't think he, he took it very seriously. But eventually when you guys came back, I pitched this to you, Dave, that um, I was interested in doing a big trip in Labrador. And you were also interested. Always. So then I was too- Shout out to anybody else out there. If you really want to do a trip in Labrador, just send in your app. Please <laughs> down. So that, 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 was, that was two of us. And that was enough to convince Alex that this was an actual thought that was, that was thought out. So then Alex was in, and then you did that trip this past, that past summer with Chris, where you yeah, guys did, a, did a big trip the year before with Chris in the Northwest Territories, and that trip too was was it was pretty hard. It was 51, 50 days, thirteen hundred kilometers. We went uh, from the Northwest Territories Yukon border all the way to uh, the Mackenzie River and up the Great Bear River and across Great Bear Lake. Uh, yeah, it was. Crazy and Chris. So I knew Chris. Chris had the chops to come along too. So when it came up, well, we need a fourth. Well, it obviously has to be Chris. He has. To, he has to come. He has to come. I think so. it took a single email to convince me. I think Dave just said there was something along the lines of Labrador question mark. And I was like, "Yep, I'm in. I don't even need to know." <laughs> Yeah, for like Chris and I, a lot of our mentors or people we looked up to in the canoeing world, like Al Sturt and Herb Pohl and um, all these guys, uh, they always rave about going up to Labrador, Northern Quebec, and I've been reading about her for years and years and years, and I've been just itching to get up there. So to be able to put together a team or find Noah or meet Noah and him be like, I really want to do this. This, this is, the timing's too perfect. We, we have, this is, this is great. I never met Chris before, but and Dave, we didn't really know each other that well at that point. But you yeah. could vote, you could vote for Chris, and then you obviously had the experience. Like we've been on those overnighters here in Nova Scotia, and we've been tested on those, and cold and bothered and wet. If you do one night, you can do thirty-five nights. Why not? It's just yeah. thirty-five one-night trips. And I, I guess that's what we did. And then Alex, me and Alex, have been growing, growing up together camping, so. We, we have very similar personalities in terms of being able to deal with that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So we kind of went in blind in terms of not knowing Chris, you guys didn't know Alex. And then we all kind of, it worked out perfectly and we can get to more of that after, but uh, let's just carry along here. What are the best resources that we use for planning the trip? Pat Luta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pat Luta. I, I would definitely say, um, more so, and this is advice to all canoeists everywhere in the world, rely on people who have done these trips before or been to the, even if it's just little chunks of where you're going, because they've seen it and they know what to expect and they can give you a good idea. And most of the older generation of canoeists that I know and I've run into are very detailed people and can tell you, you know, within a very high degree of accuracy, where the portages are, what you're going to expect. And even though there was a good chunk of unknown on this trip, I think certainly our biggest resource was the people who came before us and were able to give us advice on whether or not we were crazy or, you know, tweaking yeah. little bits of the route. Yeah. So Google Maps, Google Earth. Yeah. So the other thing is that there wasn't really, there, there wasn't a Jeff's Maps that we could follow. Um, there, there was there was no marked portages on maps. There there was no route information. It, it was talking to these old these older folks. Yeah, you reached, but we talked to like Jim and Ted Baird brothers. Uh, yeah, they've been up there in the Adler talk. Uh, there's a couple sporadic trips from the area too. You can get little bits of information from. You just got to dig around. You just got to dig around. The trip reports are all out there on like my CCR or uh, whatever paddling club you're part of. Uh, Chris, what's it called? Snow walkers? Oh yeah. Um, Northern wilderness travelers conference in Vermont, like a smaller version of the Toronto symposium. Uh, but like you mentioned before, Al Sturt, Dave Brown, the Conovers, a lot of people who been all over that area. Yeah. And then the wilderness canoe association and out of Toronto and they host the wilderness canoe symposium every year. It's quite the group of people. Yeah. They'll know everything. And, and reaching out to outfitters up there too, like like Robin Reeve, uh, Stan, yeah. Stan Pickett. 
Yeah, just do your research, right? Call everybody. And uh, again, we started planning this trip about six months before we actually went, give or take. At least, yeah. Yeah. Maybe eight months. But we only did that because we were applying for grants and funding. So we were putting together the whole proposal, which was due in like January. So we had to have it to get, we started that in like December. But after that was submitted, we essentially had the whole trip planned, except for all the actual making of the food and things. Fine details. <laughs> what was the most valuable piece of equipment that we brought on the trip? Trip guitar. I was yeah. not expecting that. Yeah. The Speedy Stitcher. <laughs> yeah. Speedy Stitcher, yeah. I'm still on the, my, my NRS bag with stitches in it. Same here. Mine's still stitched up. I think it's still stronger than mine's. <laughs> I would say the dry pants for me. The, the Kokotat Hydrus Tempest dry pants. Those are pretty important. Those are pretty important. Yeah. Maybe the bug shirt too, maybe. Oh man, the bug jacket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of important pieces of gear. <laughs> well, it's funny because you really, it, there's two ways to interpret that because you really pare down everything to what's essential. Like if we lost our tent, our sleeping bag, or whatever, even one piece of gear, you know, you we do have redundancies, but you're pretty much done. So I don't know how you can either interpret that, what's the most important extra piece or what, you know, what did you find most helpful? Yeah, we really didn't have that much. Like when we pushed off of the landing, there was room in the canoe. We could have stuffed it with more things. Yeah. Don't know that we could have carried much more over those no. uh, land crossings. <laughs> no. No. So is there anything that we wish we brought? Something to sit on, like a piece of foam that I tie around my waist. I, I'd say a butane lighter, one that has like those little jet flames, because everything mm. was so wet. I, I think we packed pretty efficiently. Like there, there was nothing that I was really upset that we didn't have. You know, like, I feel like we made do with what we had and it worked. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I knew we made a list. Made a list. A cutting board. Yeah. Uh, baby powder, baby wipes, tensor bandage, <laughs> uh, curved needles. Remember that one, boys? Curved needle. Remember that. Uh, uh, dental putty. The patches. Dental putty and tiger bomb. Tiger bomb. Oh, tiger bomb. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the official list, I think. Next item. Is there anything we brought that we were disappointed with or underperformed? I don't know. We definitely had a lot of packs break, but like, I don't know. Like, I feel like a, it's uh, the way we were packing them. It's kind of like it was bound to happen. Yeah, I feel like because they all broke, I feel like we, there wasn't much we could really do about that. Yeah. I had an issue with my sleeping pad on, on the second week it popped and I was sleeping on the ground for the rest of the, the trip. Yeah, I forgot about that. I bought a sleeping pad off Amazon on a whim right before the trip. And uh, I, I guess that goes to show you that you should probably do your tests before you, you take it on a, on a long trip like that. I remember one night crawling into the tent. Noah was passed out. Well, he was sick laying on the ground with this blown up thermarest on top of him. So I woke him up to say, no, you didn't get on your thermarest. He says, I'm saving the comfort for later. <laughs> <laughs> Those were some dark days. <laughs> what were some slipper items that we enjoyed? I'd say the Yeti. For those who don't know, Yeti is a huge like half gallon thermos that keeps anything hot for like 24 hours. And on those real cold days, we would fill it to the brim with like tea or coffee, or even just hot water. So at lunchtime. Bangle. Yeah. <laughs> it was a hot commodity out there. 
I think that was one of the only few things I actually ever always tied into the, into the canoe. That thing was always strapped in. It's crazy. We might lose everything else, but we'd have the Yeti. <laughs> like, like back here, you got to make sure you have your wallet on you, your cell phone, your, your car keys. But out there, it's Bengal Spice Yeti. <laughs> yep. The guitar I'd also add to that list. I was just going to say that. It was a slipper item, but you uh, serenading us at night, that was a big part of the trip in terms of sanity. Yeah, it was really nice. Also, one of the most durable pieces of equipment that we brought with us on the trip because it just hung off the bare barrel in a soft shell case, a wooden guitar, and literally like withstood pretty much anything we threw at it, even when we threw it with the bare barrel. Dave, you took that on a trip out recently, you know? Yeah, it still goes on all the trips, yeah. It's still going. I've only had to change one string on it. (laughs) What was the purpose for the pool noodle on the paddles? Oh, that's to keep them keep them afloat. If you drop them when like in a rapid or it gets wedged between something or you dump your canoe and you let go of your paddle, which you're not really supposed to do. But happens. Uh, then it floats. It helps it float. It makes it more visible if you need to go find it again too. I was gonna say visibility thing too, for sure. Yeah. And you put like reflective tape to hold the foamy in place. Because you only have we only brought eight paddles, so we brought four white water paddles each and four like flat water paddles each. And <clears throat> if you're to lose one, you're, you know, you're in trouble. I also had someone ask me if we put anything on our, on our yolks. And I said that we also had, you guys had shaved down some pool noodles originally. And Noah and I took ours off eventually because we felt like it was counterbalancing the canoe or whatever, but um, that you guys had left yours on for most of the trip anyways. I still maintain that was a terrible decision. Anytime I had to carry that canoe without the pad, it was terrible. <laughs> That's how I felt about the tongue strap that you had. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Put all the weight that's on you onto your neck. <laughs> Tell you, it works. What was the single best lure that we had on the trip for fishing? A mouse. I would think all in all, it was that spoon that Dave had on his spin rod. It was gold and red and it was like this big. Five of diamonds. Just like heavy, heavy spoons. Heavy spoon. Big spoon. Heavy spoons, yeah. If you really need to catch fish to eat because you're really hungry, it's just best to tie on a spoon, troll or cast. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of questions about it because we didn't film it fully through because our GoPro died. But when we pinned the canoe, on the upper Mustaston River, how did we unpin it from that rock? The first or the second time? Because the first time, I don't know how we got it off. It was me and Alex. I do not remember. Did you black out? I might have. I, <laughs> I don't know how we got it off because it was completely underwater and it was you know, fully wrapped. I think the reason you don't remember is because I almost crushed you with the canoe. Well, that could be. I do remember like spider monkey on a rock to get away from it. That big massive one where it got pinned the second time. I don't think I was I don't think I was fully anticipating it coming off as easily as it did once everything was out of the canoe. It should have, but I think it did. Yeah. Maybe it had been slowly sliding up the rock, who knows? And the second time it was pinned less badly because it was more or less straight and all four of us just kind of heave hoed it to the shore. And like you kind of rolled it upstream. Mm. Remember when we did that too? Remember there was a fish in the boat? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Had and on that question, did we lose any gear during that then? No, I think you should talk about the fly rod though real quick. Uh, Chris and Alex pinned, pinned this canoe and me and Dave are down river kind of watching this happen. And all the gear was floating down river to the next set of rapids. And there was the bear barrel floating down and then my fly rod. So I... So I was looking at both of them, and I started paddling hard towards the fly rod. And, and Dave reminded me that the our food barrel with weeks worth of food is more important than the fly rod at that time. And uh, we got both, so that was fine. But that's probably the better decision is to get get our food than, than the fly rod. Funny story, but we definitely did recover everything. Yeah, we got everything. It was lucky.
And I think if we had, I know I talked about only tying in the Yeti, but I think if we had tied everything in, we would have never gotten it off. Uh, Cause like Alex said, once the gear, we started throwing gear out at, at a certain point, just because that was the only way to, we're trying to lighten it to get it off. And I think that was the only reason we were able to get it that first time was because it didn't have all the stuff in it. If we had tied it, we'd be cutting a lot of rope. And it would have been a bigger mess, I think. For sure. And if everything isn't dry bags and you have like another boat down there, you should be able to retrieve everything. Right. So to food now, what were everyone's thoughts on Noah's 1,000 calorie bushwhackers oats? See, I developed the smartest idea of everybody. It's a brilliant plan. I couldn't actually finish it in one. I couldn't. I couldn't finish it at all. Not until the very end of the trip could I actually finish the whole uh, pro meal in one in one go. So when I would just get tired of it, I would take whatever was left of it and pour it into my Nalgene bottle and just kind of leave it there all day. Whenever I was drinking water to hydrate, <laughs> I would have food in there too, waiting for me. <laughs> just kept paying off throughout the whole day and it wasn't really a problem until one night i went to go brush my teeth and my nail gene was full of pro meal still <laughs> i feel like there was also a point where you had flavored water it just stayed in there forever it just it just every four days just got more and more and more and it was like fermenting pro meal <laughs> it was delicious. There, was a, there was a point where it was bright orange i do remember that but Dave's idea actually caught on. Chris and I started doing it as well. Yeah. No one ever had an issue. He crushed his within seconds every morning. It was just gone. Man, I eat that every morning, like here in, in the city. Yeah. <laughs> the next question is how much weight did we lose? I lost, I I lost 15 pounds. I lost 12. I lost five pounds. I gained like five or 10 pounds. I don't, <laughs> I always gain weight on trips. It's weird. You, well, you don't have much weight to lose. It's all muscle you're gaining. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it on Alex and Dave. I, I saw you guys. You looked a lot like bonier at the end of that trip. Got to get back on that diet soon. Yeah. Double chocolate bar days. Well, that's the next question. How many candy bars did we pack? Not enough. Well, I did some calculations. Oh, great. And so assuming, so let's just start off with normal bars, like, like granola bars, cliff bars, candy bars, chocolate bars. We all packed two bars a day for 36 days for four people. And if my math's correct, that's 288 bars that we packed. Fill a bear barrel just with bars. Yeah. And then in chocolate bars, we packed 198. Nice. And I think we can all agree that Dave's double chocolate bar day was the best day. <laughs> yeah. The peanut butter or Henry days. See, when you're packing the food, it's like, oh, I'll switch it up. I'll get fancy. I'll get fancy. But really, if you just packed... 198 peanut butter oh Henry bars, like everybody would be so happy every day. <laughs> and we were. <laughs> or Wonder Bars. Wonder Bars were a hit too. I would say Wonder Bars is my favorite. I think there's a lot of calories in Wonder Bar. It's like 310 calories in one. Whereas like a Mars bar would be like one 260 and a Snickers is 280. You really want the bang for your buck, right? Because it weighs 55 grams. And it's like if you can get 310 calories out of that 55 grams, it's going to. It's better than getting 240. Definitely. Basic math. I think I would change my strategy up next time and do less uh, nuts and more chocolate bars. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I think you guys are sick of the warm nuts by the end of it. The warm nuts, the cold nuts. Yeah. <laughs> like what's for breakfast? Uh, nuts and milk with granola and then what's for lunch today uh nuts and beef jerky <laughs> those are a lot might, of nuts <laughs> i might tweak it next time uh, try, try to keep us all healthy when we're all just pounding chocolate bars <laughs> is there any food that we wished we packed gummies yeah uh, desserts 
Yeah. Although Chris made up some pretty good desserts along the way. Yeah. I, I would honestly, say... I don't want to put anything, but yeah. Powdered eggs and butter, because it was cold enough that butter definitely would not have gone bad. Butter would go bad in warmer weather? It can. It can go rancid over, over time. Like if it was 90 degrees every day sitting in the hot canoe, I'm sure it would eventually. But when it's so cold and rainy all the time and the water's freezing, the boat's freezing, it would have been fine. And it stayed cold. <laughs> we could have brought some pork chops. They probably would have lasted too. <laughs> yeah. I was amazed that we still had cheese on like, uh, on like day 30, I think, or... Yeah. It was pretty moldy. Uh, yeah, I guess. Like, Dave had to cut a couple pieces off, but it was still pretty good. Cheddar survived, I think, the whole thing. Oh, yeah, I brought some of that old tent that Vermont Cheddar home. Oh, did you? Yeah. So, what did we do about canoe and tent partners and, like, the rotation between that? We We planned on having, like, partners in the canoe for the whitewater sections, but that's not how it ended up working out. And the tent mates, we, uh, we had a plan to switch up once a week, but we might have. Yeah, we stayed with that, didn't we? Pretty much. We switched up. Yeah, like, like, not on like a, a seven day rotation, but like essentially what we did is, is we rotated. Um, your canoe partner was also your, your tent partner. And every so often we would switch to keep it fresh. But then what Dave said there is um, for whitewater, since Chris and Dave have paddled a lot together and Alex and I have paddled a lot together, we wanted to have the whitewater teams the same because we're familiar with, with, with those strokes. But in the case of uh, the upper Miss Aston, I, I was in the front battling dysentery. So I, it was pretty much Dave in one canoe and then Chris and and Alex in the other canoe, and, and uh, well, you guys, you guys know how that one turned out. <laughs> it was the rock's fault, man, not ours. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, we did some pretty cowboy moves there. That was uh, <laughs> probably not how they teach you in school. Definitely a bony section. <laughs> Very bony. If you're going to hit it, hit it straight. But realistically, if we did scout all those rapids, we would have, uh, it would have been a longer trip. Oh, yeah. We wouldn't have been able to do it. Still might have been there by now. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> there were a lot of rapids. Yeah, there were. It was good, though. Like, after we wrapped that canoe, you guys asked if we wanted to switch partners, and Chris and I knew we, we, we couldn't do that. We had to, like, battle it out and get, get our confidence back. That's right. You got back in the boat. They were, it, too, because we had that, like, continuous – like that two kilometer section, I think that was the next day that we just like flowed through both of us or both boats did. And, you know, you couldn't really stop to scout because there was nowhere to stop. And we just kind of went for it and had that big chunk that was similar to what we'd been battling, but went really smooth. I, did, I remember that one really well. That was an amazing section of the river because you could see the, the gradient of the land sloping off like ahead of you as you're looking downstream and everything was going down. Mm -hmm. Definitely go out there and practice your back paddles. Yeah. Yeah. Just in case you ever need them, you're going to want them. Hit the brakes. <laughs> On a side note, a couple of skills that I didn't think would be so important that turned out to be crucial was being able to line and track a, a canoe. Yeah. I feel like we did more of lining and tracking than we did portaging and running rapids. In very sketchy situations, like crawling under alders, up to your waist and like quick moving rapids, where you're trying to dodge between rocks and, and miss the deep holes, while trying to communicate with your partner, while getting destroyed by black flies. Yeah. And it's really the most dangerous thing you do, really, ultimately. Like your feet are all, you can't really even see the bottom of the river most of the time. And who knows what you're going to step into or onto or twist your ankle or smash your shins and your knees. And you're playing with ropes and moving water and it's like if it gets wrapped around your finger, or your hand or something and it pulls on it, your leg, like so many, so many things can go wrong when you're playing with ropes and moving water. Yeah, definitely.
I remember going into Golan's Lake. You guys probably remember that massive, massive hole off to our left. We we were going up, and we had that little section of calm water. And we we even broke up. I think we like all four of us helped one canoe forward. Someone stayed back and tied it up, and then like three of us helped the other canoe forward. But right off to your left, there was this massive hole that was like just looking into the depths of hell. You did not want to go into that. But then you're on these rocks that are the size of like tables and cars that move when you step on them. That that was one of the more terrifying spots, I think. That was at the end of the day too. That was after a full day mm-hmm. of, of walking up that river and it was like raining, it was getting dark. That river being, the, we did 14 kilometers upstream on the George River that day. Yeah, walking pretty much most of it. I remember getting to that final set because it was after that portage that we did right after Noah caught the massive salmon. And mm-hmm. I remember getting to that end of the portage and I thought we were like clear and then like coming around the corner and seeing another set in front of us. And it was like, oh my, like I was just like so hungry, roasted at that point. I was like <laughs> over it. Yeah, that was a great <laughs> Yeah. All right, next question. All right, so this is probably, we all have our own answers for this one. Moss or toilet paper, what's your strategy? <laughs> all moss, all the time. I did not bring toilet paper. I was saving my toilet paper so that if things went south on the moss front, I could like refresh with toilet paper for a little while, knowing that I'd maybe be able to overcome whatever was happening when I ran out of toilet paper to switch back to moss mode again. Yeah, I diversified as well. I would mostly moss, but I would keep some TP around just to sometimes when I was feeling luxurious or bad for myself. Um, but usually I would try to like do a little bidet action too, a little, little rinse afterwards when possible. I like that though, a diversified TP portfolio. <laughs> I only brought like, I brought like less than a roll for the whole trip. So it's not like I was really using any. Yeah. I used my toilet paper when it was either like very uncomfortable situations, but I, I used my entire roll when I had dysentery. I'm pretty sure you tapped into our reserves. I did because you guys are nice guys. <laughs> but getting up in the middle of the night every hour to do some number two business, the last thing I wanted to do was stuff moss up my butt. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I definitely depleted my resources there and I wasn't thinking properly and I, and I feel like if I went back, I would have had more self-discipline and focused on the moss game during those nights. Well, you don't deny a dying man his comfort, so, you know, yeah. you had to use it. <laughs> I, need, I needed some creature comforts. I had to share the tent with him through all this, too, especially those first two nights when we were at that crazy beach site <clears throat> right at the Hyde Lane. Yeah. Yeah, and then I broke my teeth, tooth almost immediately afterwards, and then these two, Chris and, and Alex, are like, well, I may as well just put these two guys in the same tent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Call it the infirmary. <laughs> no, uh, toilet paper is pretty much like your only creature comfort at that time because your sleeping pad didn't blow up, eh? Yeah, I was just sleeping on the ground and it wasn't even flat when we did that, <laughs> that, that two nights in that one campsite. That was probably the lowest point of my life, I would say. It was, <laughs> was lying on that, that undulating ground with stomach <laughs> issues, no toilet paper left, no sleeping pad, weeks away from civilization. The, the most remote part of the trip. Yeah. 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 And he didn't tell anyone that his mat didn't work either because I think we, we started, well, after that, we started sharing our mats and each taking a, you know, a night on the flat one. So we're not terrible people. We didn't make him sleep on the ground then. He didn't tell us. Yeah, you kept that to yourself for a while. Yeah. That, that is true. I couldn't do much though. Like looking back, I wish I would have filmed myself dying in the tent, but like, I, I couldn't even write my journal. I couldn't even read. Like I was just like looked at the side of the tent for, for 48 hours, really. I remember I handed you the GoPro one day and you're like, yeah, man, I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Rough times. All right. Okay. On that note, next question is what was the lowest part of the trip? 
I would say that was my lowest part was the dysentery. Folded canoe. Yeah, breaking the tooth and getting out of the, knowing I'd broken the tooth for two hours and paddling with it and then getting out of the canoe and then feeling it disintegrate on me. Yeah. And then that next night like that, we had, we had a campsite somewhere along there. I mean, there was a pretty somber mood in camp. We actually had the evacuation conversation. Yeah. It's before we got on the upper Mistaston. Uh, for me, it was probably that day going into the Lockerbie show because I was having some stomach issues of my own and it was just cold and wet and a lot of hard work and I wasn't feeling 100% either. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a tough day. I didn't say a word that day. Not a word. <laughs> I don't think I did. Yeah, you were really quiet. Yeah. We walked two kilometers upstream in the river to get to the bottom of that last falls. Remember you two, Chris, yeah. Alex, and Noah, you line up and we just like, no, we're portaging this one. <laughs> <laughs> I remember earlier on, we, and we could have lined like, like the shore was really open. We could have lined it pretty easily. But we all chose to walk in the river because the act of going upstream was the only thing keeping us warm. Yeah, it was freezing. That was one of the coldest days of the trip, I would say. Mm -hmm. All day. And it was so beautiful the day before. It was it was such a cruel joke. <laughs> that was such a cool spot though, going through there. Like mm -hmm. like to get into Lacma Show, like it's like it was like a mountain range and the this river was just pouring through it through these two mountains. I remember Lac Michaud being really a neat spot. For me, that was the kind of transition from the Boreal to the Barren Lands. Like the first time I started noticing all the hills had no trees on, on them. So flipping that, what was the highest point of the trip? I would say getting to Mistassin Lake like seeing it for the first time after those like that week of just uncertainty. Getting to the, like so many, so many answers here, right? It was like yeah. getting, getting the first day when we crushed 54 kilometers dead calm. Like we sat in a frying pan all day, just paddling. It's like that, that excuse me, that, that canyon, oh, really the first waterfall and that, that rapid that almost got you two guys, but then like styling it and like when you nailed something on a big set when you had no choice whatsoever. It's like, well, we have to run this. And then, and then you get to the bottom and you're like, boom, nailed it. Always the best. Always that was best. actually going to be my, that was going to be my original answer was that canyon. That canyon was sweet. Yeah. Those waterfalls were something else. That last one that we port we left to portage around the two day portage to get to No Name Creek. That last one there, that thing was bananas. The double one. Yeah. 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 So too. But the first one with all the like, just like the big like fault line that we were like following along, like it was like, I don't know, it was a really cool looking section. On a map, it looked weird because it was like a T. Like like the contour lines didn't make sense. And it literally was a T. Like that that's what had happened there. It was just like a you know, the contour lines didn't make sense, but they all kind of made sense when you saw it. I can't believe we actually got to go there. Like what a spot. Yeah. That whole section between the, the six kilometers before between that first waterfall at the top, the T, to like where we left the river, that, that whole section in there was Yeah. That was worth it Man. all. So much work. <laughs> Well, that's funny because I think my favorite day or parts of the day, and you might think I'm crazy, but it was the, the second day of that portage after the massive waterfall when we had to go down the hill and we had, you know, we crashed through that willow choked stream and went down the hill. And then like when we got all the stuff and we were on that beautiful no name river, that whole day was kind of pretty fun looking back because i'm not there right now we thought we had it made in the shade we were like high-fiving up top like yeah boys yeah. we did it and then like it took us like six hours to get down to the bottom of that dave saved our life by making us soup <laughs> Ooh, that'd maybe be another food item that i'd add to my list like bring more like bonus soups 
but yeah, that paddle, Chris, like that we had after that was just like through the mountains, just winding back and forth. And it was like sunny out and that was insane. I think it was that much sweeter that we just finished that, like, at, like probably the worst portage I've ever seen in my entire life. I think I'm an optimistic guy, but when I was on that portage, I did not think we were getting out of that. I thought that was it. Yeah, it was definitely hard to, to see the light. There was no light. <laughs> light doesn't penetrate these places. <laughs> we were all evaluating what gear. Yeah, we were all evaluating what gear we had on us to make sure we could survive the night. I had the bug shelter with me. My God, be all right. <laughs> we, didn't even, we didn't even use a bug shelter that entire trip, pretty much. No, that's right. That's a piece of gear we did not use. There's a bunch yeah. of pieces of gear we did not use. Anything uh, in that black bag, really? Yeah, we had a black bag full of things we didn't really need. <laughs> what was in there? Like, we had the bug shelter was like... Not Most of it. It yeah, just wasn't the stove. Space to put it up. Yeah, the stove, yeah. The stove and two liters of gas? One yep. liter. Two. Didn't need them. Shotgun. Not a, not a shotgun. Five pounds of shells. <laughs> at least. At least five pounds. <laughs> Air tanks, too. I didn't need that. What was that last one, Dave? Uh, just the case that the gun was in. That, oh, yeah. that was soaking wet all the time. 15 more pounds of water. Uh, there was must have been a bunch of things in there I didn't use. Shelter though it was surprising. It just you just didn't need it because like you just want to you can't put a bug shelter up directly over top of your fire. The only place you really want to hang out is directly on top of your fire. But but not too close to the fire where you burn your bug net. <laughs> I mean, cause all our spare time we're not doing chores and we're in camp. Like we're standing huddled around the fire trying to dry pieces of clothing off. <laughs> yeah. So we did. That's just what we did all night long for hours. And as soon as one piece of clothing would dry off, you'd throw it into the tent and then you'd grab something else. The classic look of the dry pants around the ankles in the long johns, standing by the fire with the bug shirt on over it and socks on, in your hands, trying to dry them. That Ikea sock rack we built at uh, <laughs> the confluence of the George River, that was pretty, that was pretty nice. So an another story that... Uh... A lot of people were, were asking about was the the bet between Chris and Dave with the chocolate milk. Yeah, I mean, what happened there? I won. I'm still mad. I lost. I'm we, not. We got two <laughs> two two consecutive sunny days. Actually, the last like six days of the trip were pretty nice, weren't they? It did technically rain. I think most of them. We didn't get another consecutive full sun days, but they were nice days. It just it rained rain. in the morning or something. Yeah. It did, but I remember I got it. I remember the first morning after we had arrived in Maine. I, st I woke up in the morning and it was, it was pouring rain. Everything was muddy. Everything was soaking wet. I bled at some point in the day from doing something and I was covered in dirt. The only thing that really changed once we arrived in Maine is that I got to drink chocolate milk in bed. It was freezing cold, it was pouring rain. Actually, yeah, like some of those nights in Maine were some of the coldest. I remember it being really cold in the in the tent. Yeah, it was like five degrees. So yeah, when we got for that rec center, we would have been screwed. Yeah, that, that rec center was awesome. Hanging out with the kids. Yeah. And some basketball. <laughs> <laughs> the dodgeball. Yeah. Chris, I have a vivid memory of you hiding behind a garbage can while we were playing dodgeball with the kids. <laughs> It was a rolling one, so I was using it like a shield, and they got so mad at me. They were calling me out all over the place for cheating, which I clearly was, but still. <laughs> so when we got to Maine, um, Alex and I flew back, and then Dave and Chris, you guys took all the gear back to Goose Bay with you. And you took On the ferry. The ferry, yeah. How was that? It was great for like the first two hours because there was some pretty sweet scenery getting out on the, the Labrador Sea there. And it just mind numbingly boring for the remainder of the 48 hours we were stuck on this boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. You guys got to camp on the deck though, no? They did yeah. let us pitch, it, pitch the tent on the top deck or one of the decks on the ferry, which is sweet. But then like, it was also raining all the time while you're on the ferry and like on the deck of the ferry, there's a little bit of water on it, like just a bit, right? Cause like it drains off the side, but like it, it's a big boat. So then the, the boat's moving like this and there's this puddle of water on the surface of the ferry that's splashing around. It's constantly running underneath your tent. There's nothing you can do about it. Everything's soaking wet, you're freezing cold. You're bobbing around in the North Labrador Sea, yeah. We met some pretty cool people though. We got to see the communities. Like we yeah. got out uh, McCovic and Postville, uh, Rigolet, uh, Natrashish. Yeah. So that's that would, cool. That's, that's, that would have definitely been cool to see. Meet some people. Yeah. Mm. It's definitely a good way to get up there on a, on a budget for sure. It's a good access point. I, I would do it again, but now that it's been 11 months, I'm saying that. Yeah. But I would do it again. Sure. I would do it twice for a trip if it meant I had to, if I had to drive to Goose Bay and then take a ferry to Nain and then do a 35 day trip and then take a ferry back and drive home, I would, I would totally just do it. Yeah. It's worth it. If it was just after like not being bored or always having something to do, having nothing to do was crazy. And I drank so much chocolate milk that can't have helped. Yeah. Every town you stop and you grab another two liters and that'll get you through till the next town you need to stop and get more. All right, boys, we're running out of time here. Um, there's one more, there's, there's a few more questions, but there's one more main question. What was the one lesson that you took away from the trip? I would say your mind is your strongest weapon out there. Like most, most of the, the stuff out there was the, like the hardships had to do with like your mindset uh, in terms of like the bugs, the constant rain, the um, injuries, you can physically get through it. But if you have a weak mind out there, you're going to quickly be in trouble. And I found uh, your mind's a lot stronger than what you think it is. I think considering how worried I was about like some of like the, the bugs and the rain and, and all that, and like what the portages were going to be like. I think like I, I really came to appreciate all of them on their own, like just like the change between them. I guess I still really, really like new cripping. Yeah. <laughs> really just love Labrador. Yeah, definitely going back. I mean, I just love this spot. I think uh, maybe not necessarily a lesson I took from this trip, but you're but from watching your video series is that I have a very selective memory and very rose tinted glasses when it comes towards a lot of this stuff. I remember it a lot more fondly than it's depicted. I think I've edited out the bugs and the rain in my mind somewhat. I've always said that's what makes a great canoeist is a selective memory on the bad stuff. Cause any sane person would never do this twice if they had an option not to. But you remember the good times, and it's worth it to go back and do some more. Have you guys have any plans for this summer, or anything you guys are willing to talk about? I have a messed up summer. I mean, yeah, I've done two big trips in two summer, two consecutive summers previous. So I'd already said to myself I wasn't going to go through all the the motions of organizing another really long trip this summer, but. Change gears, maybe, maybe with uh, the pandemic and Nova Scotia is kind of closed still. So if I leave, I know I have to, if when I come back, I need to quarantine again. So this could be the summer for maybe, maybe a bicycle trip. Maybe I'll tour around Nova Scotia on a bicycle. Yeah, I, I think it's the same with, uh, same with me too. Like th this summer is kind of, uh, there's so much uncertainty. But I, I think also doing this Labrador trip, originally I wanted to do it to scratch an itch that I thought would just, I could put behind me, but it really sparked uh, a curiosity and interest into to doing more of these trips. It's, uh, it's pretty addictive. So many options, right? They're endless. And this is the thing about traveling is that you travel anywhere, whether you like, you like going international and going to cool places around the world, it's, it's the same kind of traveling that we're doing uh, throughout Canada uh, by canoe. 
And every time you go to one place, it just unlocks all these other places that you then want to go see. And once you realize that you never actually be able to see it all, but it, it just, it's so intriguing that there's just so much to see. Every time you go to one place, there's just so much more. Like the North Rim, the North, North Branch of the uh, Kogluk. I got to finish up the rest of the Kogluk someday. I got to go and do the part that we missed because we came in down pretty uh, well downstream of where you can actually go. So got to go back there. Taking advice from our friends, uh, Crystal and James in Nain, I think we need to go further north too. Because if we thought that this was woe, apparently it's even more woe once we get to the Touring Gats. All right, boys, this is perfect timing as we're about to get cut off here. Awesome. Well, yeah. Good chat, boys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chris, it was nice seeing your face. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. I'm stuck down here in the States. I can't get across the border. Who set up the camera for you? Well, you notice my name is Elise Giard. Yeah. I had to borrow my sister's computer because mine is ancient and the webcam's broken. And also there's tape on it that's like been on there since I got it. So it doesn't come off. So awesome. I had to steal I had to steal my little sister's computer because I don't have one that works properly. But just as you were on the trip, very resourceful, man. <laughs> Chris, there's another question about the reflector oven. Did you make that from scratch or yeah, um, the only thing that's important in a reflector oven is that that angle is, I think it's like a 55 degree angle, the top and the bottom piece kind of got to hit at that angle. The rest of it, you can just build around that and do whatever. Just that simple, but, yeah? Yeah, that, that one's a bit more of a refined prototype. The first one I made went on, or uh, second iteration I made went on the Northwest Territories and I need to make this one a little stronger. So this is like revision three of Reflector Oven. Worked well. Yeah, did the job. Yeah. It made some pretty epic blueberry cake or whatever that was. Yeah. And the open face grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah, that was good. Oh man, I could use one of those right now. <laughs> <laughs> or just straight up fried cheese. Yeah. Don't even mess around. Just fry your cheese. All right, boys. It was a nice catch up. Yeah. Yeah. Get out there. Chris, come to Canada. We're going on a trip. I'll sneak up there. Just paddle the St. John and accidentally go across the border. If you boys all want to go on a trip again one day, I'd be open to it. Yeah, give me a call. I'd be open to that. Yeah. Until the next one, boys. Sweet. Found it.